We know that salvation is by grace, through, fra through faith. It's free. But discipleship is by works through faithfulness, and it's costly. Our eternal salvation depends on Christ's love for me, Christ's commitment to me, and Christ taking his cross for me. Discipleship means, involves my love for Christ, my commitment to Christ, and my taking up my cross daily for him. The focus of eternal salvation is eternal life. Discipleship, however, focuses on eternal rewards. Eternal salvation is an unbelie involves an unbeliever's response. Discipleship involves a believer's response. Eternal salvation is instantaneous and a new birth. Discipleship is progressive and a continued growth. Eternal salvation is, depends on one condition, believe. Discipleship depends on many conditions, which I'll mention later. Eternal salvation is inclusive of all. Discipleship is exclusive. So let's talk about some of these. Break them down and talk about them by category. First of all, lordship salvation misses the mark for discipleship because it confuses justification and sanctification. We've said a lot about this already. We won't spend a lot of time here. Just as they confuse faith in their definition of faith, justification, sanctification, the same with discipleship. Justification being the declaration of God of our positional righteousness before him. Sanctification being our progressive growth in righteousness and godly conduct. Learning to live in obedience. Learning to live up to our new position. But we cannot confuse the two. They are related, but they must remain distinct. How clear that comes out in the book of Romans, where justification is clearly dealt with in the early chapters, chapter 3, verse 21, through chapter 5. And then when we come to chapter 6, we, we find a discussion of our sanctification, usually 6 through 8. Isn't it interesting that in the book of Romans, the first command doesn't come to chapter 6 and verse 11? Why is that? Because obedience has nothing to do with justification, everything to do with sanctification. And so the commands don't begin until chapter 6 and verse 11. Another problem with lordship salvation is it negates grace with works. What does Romans 11 chapter 6 say? If it's of works, it's no longer grace. Pretty simple. You can't mix the two. It's either by works or by grace. Lordship salvation confuses the two. Free grace believes that it is through faith we are saved, through faith in Christ. But it is through, dis through faithfulness to Christ that we are discipled. Lordship salvation talks about costly grace, but free grace says that salvation, that there's only one kind of grace and it's free. Discipleship is costly, but grace is free. John MacArthur says, quote, salvation is both free and costly, unquote. How so? How can something be free and costly? Well, he says it's a paradox, a seeming contradiction. No, it's just bad theology, bad English and bad logic. A cannot equal B. Is salvation costly? To God, yes. To Jesus, yes. But we have a word for that, and the word is redemption, which in its essence means to purchase or to buy. It implies cost. Let's be more careful, as we've been exhorted, to talk about salvation in its various terms and various perspectives. When we talk about eternal salvation and its cost, we talk about redemption, but the cost is not ours. It's God's. It's Jesus. He paid the price. But what does Romans 3 and verse 24 say? about our redemption and the freeness of salvation? Couldn't be clearer. Romans 3, 24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Free to us, costly to God. And the only reason we can have a free salvation is because God paid a tremendous price. So we don't, we don't say there's no price. We don't deny there's a cost to salvation. We just say God paid it by His grace. That's the wonderfulness of our salvation. Salvation is free to us, but it costs him something. To talk about costly grace is a contradiction in terms. We call that an oxymoron. Like military intelligence 
is an oxymoron. <laughs> Russian economy. <laughs> Social security. <laughs> Honorable senator. <laughs> Those are oxymorons, contradictions. There's no such thing as costly grace. Grace, by its very definition, is free. There's only one kind of grace. It's absolutely free. We talk about free grace, and that's a redundancy, but we have to do it because the debate has forced us to do it. We talk about free, the free grace movement. That's kind of like talking about the inerrant Word of God. Why do we have to say that? Or the infallible inerrant God, Word of God, or the infallible inspired inerrant Word of God. All those are redundancies, but the theology, the debate that's going on demands it of us. It's a shame. We believe that Christ's love for us is what brings us our salvation. It is our love for Christ that is part of the discipleship process. In the same way, it was Christ's commitment to me that took him to the cross and my commitment to him that helps me to grow as a disciple. His commitment to me that took him to the cross and he took up his cross and carried it down the streets of Jerusalem to Golgotha for me and I am to take up my cross daily for him in discipleship. And then we have eternal life versus eternal rewards. It's amazing to me how many times Jesus Christ and Paul the Apostle use rewards, the judgment seat of Christ as a motivation for Christian living, as something to look forward to and to shape our lives by. It was so good to hear the exhortation about keeping our eyes on the sig eternal significance of life in the kingdom of God. Because Jesus and Paul certainly did, and yet we hear so little teaching about that. And that's because, Lord, for one reason, lordship has confused the two. And they don't like to talk about rewards, and so many rewards passages are interpreted as salvation passages. Discipleship truth interpreted as salvation truth. And we lose the beauty of, of the promise of rewards and eternal significance and kingdom life. And a whole section of Scripture is eviscerated. Well, Lordship salvation confuses discipleship, which also results in an unrealistic expectation from the unregenerate. You see, the Lordship salvation view of discipleship assumes a Christian response from unbelievers. But what would an unbeliever understand about carrying his cross? What would an unbeliever understand about loving God with all your heart? He doesn't know God. Would we expect an unbeliever to give up all of his possessions or be willing to? What kind of logic, logic is it that demands of an unbeliever such sophisticated, mature Christian's decisions that I am still grappling with myself in my own life? It just doesn't make sense to expect from someone who is dead in his sins to ex expect from someone whose mind has been veiled by Satan himself to respond to God with a fully loving heart at the moment of salvation, to respond to God in total commitment, in total submission, to be willing to suffer for him. We believe that obedience and commitment is a response to God's wonderful grace. And that's why Romans 12.1 is Romans 12.1, not Romans 1.1. 1, 1. He had to wait until 12.1 so he could say, in view of God's mercies, I want you to present your bodies a living sacrifice. That's why he waits until Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1 to exhort us to walk worthy of the calling with which we were called. He had to tell us about who we are before he tells us what to do. And yet we're so guilty of getting the cart before the horse and telling people what to do before we tell them what they are and why they should do it. Even we who believe in free grace will fall into that error. Listen to the words of Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6 as well. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. There is a process. There is a progression. We receive Christ. We trust in Him as Savior. He comes inside of us. We now learn to walk with Him in fellowship. 
The progression probably comes out best in Titus. You might want to look at Titus chapter 2. I, can't, I don't think it could be said any clearer of how salvation should result in discipleship, but that they are sequential. Verse 11, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. The grace of God has appeared. Jesus has brought us salvation. That salvation teaches us, as a consequence, how to live a godly life. The word used for teaching there is a word that was used of training children. 